And uh, how are folks doing with the remote moderation? Are we good? Okay, recording and... Uh, yes, we're good. Excellent. All right. Well, um, let me quickly introduce some of our uh, esteemed panelists, and this is more or less in order from left to right. At the end, we have Bill Drake from the University of Zurich, and he is uh, involved with civil society in Switzerland, from Western Europe, and other groups. And then next to Bill, we have uh, Sarah Wynne-Williams from Facebook, which is, of course, private sector. And then we have Bertrand de La Chapelle, Academic Academy uh, Diplomatique, Civil Society of France. And then we have, uh, then we have Zahid uh, from Jamil Jamil, private sector, uh, for law firm, I believe, right, in Pakistan, Asia Pacific region, Asia Pacific group. And then we have, uh, directly next to me, we have Azumi Aizu from the Institute for Infosocionomics, Civil Society Japan, Asia Pacific group. And I'm going to keep my opening remarks very short because I'd like this to be more of a question and answer talk show type format um, to keep things uh, spicy, so to speak. Um, so, you know, in previous years, our workshops have looked at the impact of data flows and on surveillance. And as the cloud business model moves mainstream, we propose looking this year at the free expression ramifications of cloud computing. Now, in addition to free expression ramifications, the workshop will also focus on how cross-jurisdictional privacy and security frameworks and security standards can facilitate or potentially hinder um, cloud adoption and affect usage. As the cloud moves mainstream, we'll also look at free expression ramifications for businesses, for individuals, and for consumers in the debate on private cloud versus public cloud. Um, the, the only other thing I think we might want to talk about ahead of time is that we probably want to use the term cloud computing or internet computing um, as a more of a holistic term um, without creating definitions for cloud versus public cloud versus private cloud. Any proposed cloud statute or policy is essentially internet regulation by a different name. So maybe we should use the terms interchangeably for the purposes of the discussion. Now, to get things started, um, maybe, Zahid, we can, we can ask you just generally, um, what are your thoughts regarding cloud computing and freedom of expression? Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and, and I think uh, one of the things that usually you don't necessarily associate with uh, use of cloud, because everybody talks about you know, the security aspects or privacy and things of that nature, is the essential help it provides to actors in countries where they are able to host things outside the jurisdiction if it comes to freedom of expression and their, and their views. And I think this is something that is extremely helpful for democracy, for governance. Uh, I know that our you know, uh, platforms such as YouTube or Facebook and others, and Twitter, give the ability to people to actually express themselves, not only that, but to host video and content. Oops, sorry. Video and content that enables uh, a lot of the democracy and governance aspects that have, that have brought a change. To give you an example, most people remember in Pakistan, we had a, uh, a removal uh, uh, of the Chief Justice, and then there was a big movement in Pakistan related to bringing the lawyers mover to bring the Chief Justice back. A lot of the stuff that took place in getting the videos out was done on the basis of using the YouTube platform. And that is essential because that was the whole process of it. It, we had our own little bit of a spring, effectively. And that led to uh, uh, the using a cloud service, uh, to, uh, which would, could not be stopped by the government at that time, and then bring a democratic change and move away from uh, what, what was considered to be a despotic regime to a democratic process. So I think it had an essential aspect there. Um, and I think it's, it's important to keep in mind that blocking and filtering and regulation that takes place in many countries, and we're seeing more and more of it, uh, being able to host stuff and have that content locally pressing become more and more, more, and more uh, difficult, you know, challenging. And, and, the, and the way that one needs to be able to try and address that is to be able to take your content and have it posted somewhere which is in the cloud. So it has an essential role um, uh, in, in being able to protect uh, the rights of citizens and having democratic change. But I will speak more to this uh, as we go along. Oh, and I should also encourage other panelists, if they have questions or comments on what each of us are saying, we should definitely jump in and express those comments. Um, so so let, me, let me just clarify. So you're stating that the fact that a government um, so, um, so does not have access necessarily to data within a cloud service where the, where the speaker exists is actually beneficial with regards to communicating that information. 
Absolutely right. And, and, and the fact is that that gives, a, gives, gives a, a, a free speech, a person who's basically trying to express himself, an area and a space where he can do so freely without having to be hindered by the kind of restrictions that you would have otherwise. And that, that's why it's actually key and, and, and it's, it's a great safeguard. But obviously governments are aware of this tool and may not want to allow their users to have access to those services or would want access to the data that's posted on those services to find those users. Great question. Uh, and, 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 and the response to that is, well, this is exactly what happened in Pakistan, where there was a, a video called The Innocence of Muslims, which is an issue for Indonesia, for Malaysia, for Pakistan, for Egypt, and a whole bunch of different countries. So, the, the, But the response was wrong. The response was a 20th or 19th or even 16th century response of saying, it's my jurisdiction, shall so just block it off. Guess what? The Internet can be blocked. It's just not something you're able to do effectively and efficiently. And when they did that, everybody, and I, I'm telling you from a workshop in the Supreme Court, an annual workshop we have with the Supreme Court, where even the Chief Justice and the judges of the Supreme Court admitted to be using uh, elite and hotspot as their VPNs to try and get data. So suddenly what it does is it, it absolutely completely uh, 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 disables the government from being able to block anything because now everybody's got a secure VPN and that's how they're accessing the cloud services. So had they not done that, in fact, they would have probably had a little more uh, ability to control stuff. But because it took that step, which again, as I said, is a 20th century regressive step, technology was able to find a solution which is 21st century. And so guess what? YouTube may be technically blocked, but everybody's watching it. Sarah, let me ask you a question about this with regards to governments that want to try to control access to information or exercise greater jurisdiction over information which may be posted online? Um, are there some efforts around the world with regards to governments trying to control this or trying to access this? Sure. Well, I mean, one of the developments that we're seeing um, are national governments effectively trying to force the cloud to the ground and doing this through a, a number of ways. I mean, the one example of um, proposals for forced data localization or forced, um, forced infrastructure. And um, the rationale for this uh, is, is similar to some of the things that Zahid just pointed out. Uh, governments wanting greater access to data and um, the control that that gives over freedom of expression. I think um, one of the challenges in going about it this way, I mean, there are, uh, philosophical challenges for freedom of expression. There are also very practical challenges. If, um, if companies are forced to have you know, infrastructure in every country that they operate, the, the technical challenges of that are huge. We don't, um, as a company, segment our data or structure our data on the basis of national jurisdiction. There's not a Facebook data center for Swedish citizens. There's not a Facebook data center for citizens of um, Azerbaijan. And so w there's, there's a gap between um, government's desires and actual pragmatic technical reality. And part, I think part of the challenge there is, is education. And part of the challenge is just talking about the risk, freedom of expression is one element, but you're also going to drive up latency, you're going to increase the cost of access. Um, and when we look at the benefits uh, that the cloud can bring to freedom of expression, part of the challenge is broad, more broadly is around connectivity and people having access to the cloud. I think these sort of initiatives are going to make, um, create a more restrictive environment and it's going to provide, um, I think we're going to provide, we're running to a situation where regulation is not um, not aligned with, with technical and pragmatic reality. And somehow we need to have a, a conversation around that um, to end up in a situation where we're protecting the benefits of the cloud and, as I say, not forcing it to the ground. It looks like we're raising a couple of different issues. We're talking about government access to the information. We're also talking about the ability for users to access the cloud in the first place. And I think, Azumi, you might have a comment about that. But then we're also talking about um, you know, governments wanting to actually obtain the data directly. So I guess, I think, Bertrand, you were, you were involved with some, some work with regards to government access to data, maybe MLATs. Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, that work and, and why governments uh, feel that they need to revamp legislation 
for better or for worse, to improve their access to that data which is being hosted in the cloud. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, indeed, I'm, I'm the, the director of a project called Internet and Jurisdiction Project that basically looks at those issues. Um, I may take a um, somewhat provocative uh, starting point, which is sovereignty is not bad. Boys. Not only is sovereignty not bad, but it's important. Anybody who lives in a country that has no state and no correct process in the state knows what it is to have no government. The key challenge is that the international system is based on an architecture where you separate sovereignties, i.e. you determine laws that are applicable in one territory versus laws that are applicable in another territory. And the whole international architecture is based on this separation of physical territories. In each territory, the key question is, are the frameworks that deal with such issues as freedom of expression, are they balanced mechanisms that are proportionate, that guarantee fair process for citizens, that protect freedom of expression at the national level. And we know that there are very different uh, levels of protection of freedom of expression in different countries. As long as it stays at the national level, it is an unpleasant situation, but unfortunately, it has been mostly the international system until now. The problem with the internet is that it is transforming this, and it's not a problem, it's the benefit of the internet, is that it is allowing people to connect across borders, fulfilling basically, and it's probably the most incredible instrument to fulfill Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which explicitly in 48 talks about the right to access, impart, and, and distribute uh, information across borders. At each national level, there are frameworks that establish whatever limits to freedom of expression there can be. And again, in some countries they are okay, in other countries they are not okay at all. The problem is that with the internet, we're talking about cross-border spaces, and we're talking about the cloud, but we're talking about clouds and major platforms have their own cloud services. And because we're talking about shared spaces, there is a strong collision sometimes between the laws and the norms in one region or in one country and the uh, laws in another, which means that when there is a problem regarding freedom of expression on clouds, there's a tension regarding the applicable jurisdiction. And the problem is that the two solutions that are proposed until now or that are available are not appropriate in either side. You cannot have a situation that says, basically, whenever anybody posts something anywhere on a platform like Google, Facebook, or others, what this person posts should be submitted to the legislation of every single 193 countries around. So the jurisdiction based on the location of the user alone cannot be a criteria. However, the reverse is not possible either because judging that if anybody in any country posts something on an international platform that just happens to be incorporated or located in France, in Germany, in the US or elsewhere, is the French, the German, or the Thai law, or the American law that applies worldwide, is not valuable either. So how do you handle this? This is the major challenge that, that we're faced with. And I fully agree with the things that have been said before. And there was a, uh, a panel uh, yesterday on local content and how the availability of cloud services across borders is actually lowering the barrier to entry, providing a, an infrastructure that facilitates freedom of expression and, exp and, and, and innovation in general. And the danger at the moment is that the reaffirmation of pure blanket national sovereignty is leading to suggestions under the name data sovereignty of systematic location of data and the technical argument that Sarah just made, which is currently the uh, data centers of those large platforms or cloud services do not distinguish, are not structured at all according to geographic location. And so there is an amazing irony, and I finish with that, it's a longer story, but it's an amazing irony that 
if people were to be doing this in platforms, they would have to actually scrutinize and analyze and identify in a higher detail the individual data of people to know where they are location, located. But is it where they're located, or is it citizens of that country who are traveling abroad? What happened? It's technically impractical, and it's bad for the system. That being said, there is a need to discuss those things and to develop frameworks among people, and this is what, among others, the uh, Internet and Jurisdiction uh, Project is, is doing by bringing governments, civil society, private sector, international organization, technical community to try to develop um, interfaces for dealing with these tensions regarding freedom of expression, but also privacy, cybercrime, and so on. And, and you know, Bertrand, I, I think that that's, that's exactly what is needed. We need intellectual processes to deal with these issues as opposed to brute force uh, national restricted reactions. And you cannot have 20th century responses to a 21st century problem. Let me give you an example of localization. When you say, well, you have a localization requirement, as you absolutely rightly said, you know, there are two sides to every communication. One person may be your, your citizen, but on the other side of any international or email is another person from another territory. And that country has rights over that. So the moment you say, well, you know, that communication, half of it is from a Brazilian, uh, what does it do to a Portuguese? Does it mean that the Portuguese's information suddenly has to become, you know, is not protected by the European Union Directive on Data Protection, for instance? You know, these are the kind of ridiculous contradictions that will start taking place, and people have to deal with it. And this, you have to find solutions to these. Another one, which is which I find remarkable, is that on the one hand we have countries who have, you know, gone to the UNGA, for instance, and screamed and shouted about how terrible it is what the NSA, for instance, is doing when it's collecting data and all of this by cooperation of, of service providers, etc. So, okay, if the principal stand is that this should not happen, why is it? So let me let's 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 break it down. One, you're saying that another country which had the law that authorized it didn't breach that law, but did it basically on the basis of that was asking for cooperation from voluntary, by the way, from service providers within its jurisdiction and was asking for that data to be released for criminal matters, basically ostensibly, right? When you take that objection, in principle, how can you then in your own country introduce a legislation? that says, I want to be able to force, by my national law, which is the same, for the purposes of criminal matter, which is the same, to data host and localize content that will have to transfer from the US or elsewhere and transfer and make a mirror in Brazil, for instance, which is still the same, and have it disclosed if I ask it to be disclosed uh, in a criminal matter. So it, it's, it's, you know, these ridiculous rid distinctions, the contradictions will start showing that you cannot start using 20th century responses to 21st century uh, 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 problems or, or, or issues. And so sovereignty has to change from being Westphalian and borders to being sovereignty based on a borderless sovereignty, which basically what I mean by that is not that your sovereignty extends anywhere. It has to be intellectual, not physical. It has to be intellectual. You need to know how to be able to speak communicate and respond to your citizens and what they believe and what they think and how they respond. That's where you need to start getting it and not start building firewalls and walls and spaces. And that's why I think, Bertrand, your exercise in internet jurisdiction is precisely the sort of intellectual exercise that is needed. Thank you. Well, Zumi, let me ask you this question. Um, well, then, what does someone do then when content is posted online which is illegal? What is there any potential solution to it? Well, actually, before we do that, let me ask you: What is happening? What do you think is happening now with regards to content that is illegal in one jurisdiction, which is posted online, um, but legal in yet others? That's it. And it may be a very. And it, it, this may not. Don't feel like you're on the spot, but it's a tough oh, question. Thanks for the tough question. I you're have welcome. no answer. Is there anybody on the floor has a, any answer? I'm <laughs> welcome you to. Um, <laughs> And then I might ask Sarah the same question, by the way, with regards to pragmatically what's being done now, and then how can we use that to address this intellectual uh, attempt, so to speak, of trying to develop a framework for going forward. But what's the problem now with regards to that? Well, there are different kind of illegal um, content, first of all. Um, now in Japan, downloading the illegal content is deemed criminal um, for personal use, and thanks to the audio lobbying from the music and the movie industry. 
um, how do you enforce is an interesting question. But um, it is not, uh, well, somehow this um, copyright is of the US film um, studio is well protected in my country as well. So it is illegal. So, um, some of the IP holders have done a good job of trying to reach out all corners of the world with different jurisdictions. Whether this is a solution to the 21st century services such as Google or Facebook, not too sure, but um, Google has many um, policy people in my country as well as some other countries, and you're grappling with that, I believe. Um, I'd like to just put some other angle, perhaps, to the debate that I see the growing use of the smartphones and penetration getting very high, not only in the developing countries, but some corners of developed countries as well, is a kind of a twin um, with the expansion or evolution of the cloud services. With a limited storage of 16 gigabytes of your smartphone or 32, which is quite huge, say, compared with five years ago. But um, we, whether we like it or not, we use mostly many cloud-based services, such as Dropbox or Evernote, but also you ever, I haven't but there's use, but there's a new service called Line, L-I-N-E. I don't know how many of you guys use Line. Not, not too many, L-I-N-E. That's a packet-based um, voice service, messaging service. It's one of the fastest growing services. Actually, it started from Korea, Japan, joint venture company. Um, I think its growing rate is faster than Twitter. And now there's some other thing called WeChat. How many people are using WeChat? Right, that's from China. And they all, they are kind of cloud services. We don't know where they are housed. Um, and they may be coming more new applications, the apps. And unfortunately, there are some bad guys, the commercial guys, taking advantage of providing new apps, sounds very nice, and secretly um, stealing or obtaining all the user data, personal information, which, 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 what kind of application you're using, and they sell to the other parties. Um, cross-border or not, there's often they're cross-border. Who's in charge to take care of these um, some wrongdoings? On the one hand, this line or WeChat or Twitter or Facebook are all promoting the free speeches. It's very difficult for authorities to uh, scan voice data or file status. Um, it's much easier for the authority to scan the text data. Right. So, um, and also with the smartphone, you can take pictures on site of what's going wrong in Turkey or wherever. So now I think the police or military guys have to be aware of these smartphones, <laughs> whether they've been taken there on wrongdoings. Um, on the fly is very important uh, to me. So it's it's not only the cloud, and the cloud merits a lot from all the you know diverse use of the smartphones and the other way around. And so we need to consider these combinations when we talk about this cross-jurisdictional enforcement or safeguard. The last but not maybe finally, in Japan, um, we have a constitution, almost given from the US after the Second World War, um, which guarantees the secrecy of communication, which is not freedom of speech, but nobody has a right, including the authority, to go inside your private communication. You cannot open the letter. You cannot read the email unless um, authorized. But it's very difficult for the, anybody to try to you know, invade this. And the, our government has been doing a good job for that. Um, now there's an attempt from the new administration to revise the constitution, to put the freedom of speech on par with the public order. And uh, whether the secrecy of communication will be preserved as such or not is in a good question. In the current draft, there's no such a thing. So um, maybe with the, all the um, advocacy for the free speech, I think we really also need to figure out ways how to protect the secrecy of communication under the cloud. Thank you.
You know, it's interesting that distinction you make between secrecy of communication versus freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. that, that is an interesting distinction between the two. Um, and we talk about how the internet can or should be a free expression zone. But at the same time, we also talk about how there should be some sort of jurisdictional um, framework, as Bertrand had mentioned, uh, when we look at people that live in a jurisdiction that has no, that has no functional government, so to speak, which is certainly no fun either. So the distinction between the two is very difficult right now. Um, Bill, um, I want to ask your thoughts with regards to, with regards to this issue. Um, do you think that this involves discussions that, are, that, that expand beyond freedom of expression? Or are these issues that involve the cloud the development generally? Thanks. Uh, good morning. Um, the, the sound from next door is really quite remarkable. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> I'm not at all surprised that um, governments are looking to regulate uh, cloud transmissions. Uh, it's, to me, what's surprising is that it took us this long to get here. Um, and the fact of the matter is when, when uh, Zahid says sovereignty is a 16th century uh, invention or concept, well, I was quite surprised that Bertrand didn't give us the Treaty of Westphalia reference. But anyway, um, sovereignty is alive and well and um, has always been applied um, both in national and international instruments to cross-border flows of information and access to information. Um, and governments will continue to search for ways to do that. So. The whole history of global communications, if you look at the way in which different technologies have evolved over time, has been uh, impacted by the tension between, on the one hand, sets of global norms pertaining to the free flow of information and freedom of speech, and on the other hand, national sovereignty. That tension has been manifested in multiple, multiple instances. Um, I go back to the, the, the Treaty of Carlsbad. <laughs> to the Carlsbad Decrees of 1819, when German states got together and said, uh, you know, we'll have an agreement that each of us should suppress any speech coming across the border that might in some way violate our sense of national public order and sovereignty. There's been a long trajectory ever since then of efforts to territorialize any kind of cross-border transmission of information. I mean, the, the, the Treaty of Dresden of 1850, which formed the Austro-German Telegraph Union, the uh, Treaty of Paris of 1865 that created the International Telegraph Union. These established firm international uh, legal norms that said uh, states have a right to monitor um, any transmission and to stop it or terminate it uh, should they de decide that it violates their national objectives, their sense of national order and sovereignty. We had the same battles with the development of radio and the questions around uh, establishing mechanisms for non-interference for radio transmissions. We had the same battles over direct broadcast satellites and the notion that you had to have uh, prior consent before transmission. I mean, on and on and on, all through the history. We can't both talk. Um, and, and so this has been an ongoing issue, and it's inevitably when it's going to come up here. There's been a the specific and most relevant, I think, uh, cases, though, um, with regard to data flow would be, in my view, the transporter data flow uh, battles of the 1970s and 80s where governments, in fact, directly took on the question of access to databases held in foreign jurisdictions and the instruments of the World Trade Organization, which have legally binding provisions pertaining to this very same question. So um, we see then that states have long dealt with this question. It's simply that now the, the market has evolved, some new practices have emerged, and the same, they're asking the same kinds of questions that they always ask, which is to what extent do these transactions, these types of information resources, need to be embedded within a framework of territorial-based public authority? And you can say, um, Jesus, what they're doing is stupid, illogical, blah, blah, blah. And from a, an open internet standpoint, of course, personally, I may agree. Nevertheless, this is what states do. <laughs> it is inherent in their job description and is not all surprising. And, and we're seeing more and more 
that actors all across the board, from Vivian Redding and the European Commission on down, are trying to figure out how to put in place new mechanisms to deal with a particular case of cloud computing. So I think let, let's not, I think we need to transition past the point of saying, God, these states, what's, what, this is done, this is, don't they see what's wrong with this? You know, it's, it's all good for freedom of speech, et cetera, sure, 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 sure. But they've got more practical questions that they want to ask, and we have to actually engage them uh, on terms that are responsive to the points that they're making. Otherwise, you're not going to get very far. Um, and, and one of the terms I would certainly engage them on is the fact that they have made, under both OECD instruments and WTO instruments, obligations to not impede data flows. So why not start there, <laughs> um, is my thought. Yeah. So just a clarification, sovereignty will always be alive and well, but it will not be alive and well in the Westphalian model. It will not be alive and well necessarily in the physical way that it was actually in the 20th, at least up till the 20th century. The, the, the beauty of the DCPIP protocol is it says, well, I'm going to get through some way. I'm going to get this data packet through, doesn't matter how, I'm going to get it through. Let me share a thought and an example which is actually on the ground. And um, there may be countries who may be able to overcome this issue, but I'll, I'll, what happened with, with, with in Pakistan as an example. And I think the sovereignty has therefore changed from there being just absolute sovereignty that governments had over their people to, because of the internet, a question of a greater autonomy that has arisen to citizens within that country, which have interconnected like they never did in the 70s or 80s. Uh, the ITU treaty was able to say, well, you can block stuff because it was able to block it because it was easy to do that. The TCPI protocol changes that dynamic. Now, when the Innocence of Muslims video was released, it was on YouTube, um, and a lot of countries had issues with that because there were uh, protests in, in certain countries. In Pakistan, there was a protest. I know Indonesia, we're here today. I know there were protests over here. And many of the countries decided not to block, or if they did block, they blocked temporarily. Our country decided, well, what we're going to do is go ahead and block it. And it's still blocked. The problem they're having right now is they've blocked themselves off from the world. So when it went to court, there was an actual court case, which is sort of celebrated at least in our, in, in our country, where the judges started trying to grapple with this issue and the issue became more transparent. What do we do about this problem? How do we deal with it? And day after day, technical expert after technical expert was called in from the ministry, from everywhere, from foreign office, from elsewhere, saying, what's the solution? Treaty? No? Well, it doesn't matter because it's technology. Okay, can we try and block this? You're a technical expert. Can you try to? Yes, we can have VPNs. Oh, sorry, a, a, a blocking of the, of the domaining. Right, but can we get around it? Yes, there's a VPN. Can we try to block the proxies and the VPNs? No, well, if they're dynamic, that's going to be difficult as well. Eventually, giving up and saying, what's the answer here? The answer is, we need to cooperate with the service providers. So the sovereignty of this is my brute force space and I own it has to now deal with the reality that in order to maintain your sovereignty, it has to be a cooperative shared space. How do I deal with that collision? Sovereignty of that nature, much more sophisticated, not Westphalian, not brute force, not physical. And sure, that sovereignty will remain, but it has to transform into something more intellectual, transform into something more collaborative, where we can all live together. And that's why I said, what Bertrand's uh, project of internet and jurisdiction does is allows that space to have that debate. I find myself in the, in the um, funny situation that on this panel, there's nobody who represents government. And, and no matter what's the point, <laughs> uh, I happen to have been the, uh, the representative of the French government between 2006 and 2010. And the experience that I can share uh, in the work of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project this, this year, where we organized basically four meetings on exactly those topics in uh, Brazil, in um, Paris for Europe, in Delhi, uh, and in Washington, is that the presence of not governments with a big G and, and, and a one single label, but various actors within governments, including law enforcement, 
uh, foreign affairs ministry, ministries of communication, which all have different sensitivities regarding those issues, is absolutely necessary and absolutely useful for the discussion. Uh, I want to share one thing, one thing with, with, with you regarding this. The governments, some of them may be doing things for bad reasons or whatever. The problem is that a lot of them are doing things because they are using the tools that are available to them. There's no way we can solve those issues in an honest manner, in a discussion among all actors, in anything that is a purely intergovernmental discussion. So you can go to the UN, you will draft as many resolutions as you want. How do you handle the concrete problems? Not there. So your government, and I'm trying to, to, to make the case for them a little bit, you are law enforcement, and you are actually the ones who are bumping their heads on the frontiers of national sovereignty. If you get a crime that is committed in one country, there's a citizen that is really harmed. You want to get the data. Today, you have circuits that either allow you to get the data by direct contact with, with the platform, whatever, but there is no guarantee, neither for the platform nor for the other side, that fair process is being used. The platform may be accused of having cooperated when it shouldn't have, and so on. So it has to make the determination, which is a bad process. Or you go through the so-called mutual legal assistance treaties, which are so bordered with caveats and protections uh, that in most cases it doesn't work, and if it works, it takes many, many months. This is concerning the real life of people. And I want just to make the case, in some cases, you need to have content taken down. You need to have content taken down sometimes. And I'm repeating this because we tend to believe that freedom of expression is absolutely without limit. Let me get one concrete example, and Zahid is well placed to, to know about it. In India last year, and in the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, we have an observatory that collects cases regarding those issues. In India last year, there was a group of people coming from another country. I'm not sure it was Pakistan. It was another country that had a very keen desire to trigger religious infighting between different groups. What they did was they were taking a picture of Buddhist monks who in China were actually helping after an earthquake. And the picture had a lot of bodies on the ground, the people who were killed by the earthquake, and the monks were helping. And these people were circulating the pictures, explaining that these were Buddhist monks inspecting the corpses of the Hindus or the Muslims that they had killed in a, in a riot in order to trigger tension. You know what happened? And it spread virally, of course, on the uh, social media platforms. What happened is that more than 10,000 people fled their villages by fear of, uh, of concern, uh, of um, riots and, and attacks. Fortunately, nobody was killed. But if 200 people were killed in that environment, this is what, for a government, is a public order concern. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights has provisions in Article 29 for public order. And there's a whole range of protections to make sure that the response needs to be proportionate, that the protection of freedom of expression is respected, and that only when there's an urgent danger, there is a measure that's being taken. The problem is these provisions apply at the national level. There is no framework, and I insist no framework today that solves the very crucial problem of what could be called global public order, things like that. And the key challenge is to design things that allow to address those issues so that there are even more protection for those things in order to safeguard freedom of expression. But that at the same time, when there is a legitimate concern that is about the harm of individual people, it is indeed taken into account. And I give you, to finish, a second, a second element that is um, close to my own country, I'm French. In France, like in Germany, for historic reasons, there is a very strong set of laws regarding anti-Semitism. And it is completely different from the way the United States, for instance, handles anti-Semitism. 
it is criminal in France and in Germany to make anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Semitic remarks and so on. It's a criminal offense. There's a strong difference, a normative collision between the two, two sets of laws. On Twitter a couple of months ago, somebody in France used Twitter to spread a hashtag, as you know, that was called a good Jew in French, un bon juif, encouraging people to make absolutely racist and anti-Semitic jokes about that. And for whatever reason, it caught up, became a trending topic on Twitter. And this is criminal in France. So there was an association that requested that the content be taken down according to French law and that the name of the people that were, had done that was communicated for criminal prosecution in France. France is still a relatively democratic country and people in France are really attached to this, to this law for historic reasons. There is a big tension. Twitter finally accepted, but there is no procedure to do that clearly. And so to, to finish on the, on the question of the Westphalian model or not, uh, sovereignty still exists and national law still exists at the national level. Again, if there's a Frenchman in, living in France, insulting another Frenchman living in France, in French, through a media platform that just happens to be in another country, it is not completely unacceptable to think that the French law applies. If, on the other hand, it is an Australian traveling in Quito, Ecuador, and insulting on Twitter somebody who is an English man uh, living in Italy, try to find the jurisdiction that applies, and I wish you good luck. So, when you deal with transborder cases, and this is what we're talking about, to preserve the transborder system and the accessibility of platforms, because they are enablers of freedom of expression, we need to discuss with the actors that are involved, including the law enforcement and the, and the governments, how to deal with those issues in what we call in the Internet and Jurisdiction Project the challenge of digital coexistence of different norms in shared spaces. Um, by the way, um, it's a little bit early, but I think it would be a good time at this point to open up for comments or questions from the floor while we continue the panel. Um, Bertrand raised a, an excellent point. We don't have a government representative on the panel today. So if we have anyone that feels like they want to discuss their point or even discuss what they feel that their government would say about this um, in their opinion, that's fine. Um, we should go ahead and do that or any other comments. Because I think a lot of people live in jurisdictions where there are some form of, of censorship. Um, it may not be overtly possible or overtly um, obvious, rather. Many jurisdictions have... Uh, uh, and we have a comment uh, we'll get to in one second. Many jurisdictions have uh, bans on, for example, uh, uh, images involving child exploitation, um, which most people don't seem to have a problem with, of course, because it's equally repugnant in many jurisdictions. Um, just like uh, a ban on spe uh, anti-Semitic speech seems perfectly adequate or appropriate in France or Germany to many people, um, or speech uh, that, that may... Uh, that may insult uh, certain religious views or beliefs. Um, so, um, and, and I know, Zahid, you had one comment, but I think we had a comment uh, or a question. Uh, please introduce yourself uh, before you give your comment if you, if you feel you'd like to. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Braxton Perkins from NBC Universal. Just wanted to follow up on Zahid's um, uh, concept of sovereignty perhaps evolving into cooperation with service providers. Could you comment about the types of service providers that you see vital to the cooperation? Is it cloud storage companies, platforms, ISPs? Uh, just like to get your thoughts. And then secondly, in the same vein, how do you view the role of new tools or old tools to do VPNs or proxies to obfuscate where your actual location is or what your nationality is and how that translates into service providers cooperating uh, on the issue of a new concept of sovereignty. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think that the, the concept of uh, sovereignty when it relates to service providers is currently going through, I think, a transition. I think you've got many people trying different things. Some saying, well, if you've got individuals who are involved and they are citizens of mine, my sovereignty applies, another saying, no, if the data is located in my country, that's what applies. And so there's a divergence of how people are trying to apply this. So that's, a, that's something that has to evolve. 
on the side of the service providers, the way I, th I see responses is in trying to have terms of service, which basically in some way actually have a transnational impact. Um, and I think the, the greatest challenge, and one of the things I wanted to mention in Pakistan, for instance, we waited 15 minutes before we gave YouTube a chance to respond to the request to take down something, and then we blocked it. That, that's just really not the way to do it. And didn't really read the terms of service to say, well, under what terms of service provision maybe we can actually make this request. Even that wasn't done. It was just like, this is what I think this is what needs to be done. You need to do this. And, and we're not trying to interface. So I think to the extent that you can start having that dialogue with those service providers, and this is, this is without having an international treaty for this purpose or an international dialogue, but a framework in which that service providers can agree, and this is something that was discussed actually yesterday, wasn't it, in your, in your discussion, Bertrand, how can we have models and frameworks where the private sector who are either cloud computing, um, so platforms, uh, social networks, etc., come together and have a dialogue with uh, basically governments, etc., and agree to what I would say would be the common ground. More often than not, what we see that this, this entire discussion is driven by is the emotion and the passion of the extreme examples. And I think that that is important, that it needs to be discussed, we need to find resolution to that. But the, but the push that comes in trying to uh, push ahead with those extreme examples is the fact that, oh, I'm not getting cooperation on MLATs, I'm not getting cooperation on cybercrime. And to a large extent, what we see is that those countries that are doing this are, are, are victims of their own decisions. How do I, what, am I, what do I mean by that? By deciding not to join the Budapest Convention, which at least lays down a baseline of basic offenses that they can get cooperation on, they increase the pressure of not only having that issue not resolved, of illegal access, hacking, phishing, fraud, and all of that stuff, and then you have the additional aspect where you can't possibly always get consensus on should the innocence of Muslim video be blocked or not. And I think if we can make progress, at least on the common ground, the pressure that we have of using that, that the pressure that, 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 that's building up on, on, on the issues that we should be able to have a common ground and not being able to resolve and not being able to get cooperation, then impacting and becoming the momentum behind the extreme examples not getting resolved is, is something that we would like to try and uh, um, um, address. And I've been asked, well, what is the Budapest Convention? So I should explain. That is the, literally the only treaty internationally that is available to deal with cyber crime. And as a political decision, not a national sovereign interest of their own country decision, people have taken a view that, well, you know, I don't like it because I, I'd like to side with Russia or China, or I like it because I like to side with another group. And instead of actually looking out for your own national and saying, well, hold on, does this function? Does it work? Does it get me the cooperation to go after criminals? And so, in, in a sense, there's a sovereign framework there that can be joined to address that, which service providers are cooperating with. So that would be one solution. On the, the, the other question of uh, what, what, how do we view technologies, there was, a, there was an interesting debate this morning or a discussion about how should governments in the Freedom Coalition, on, on, was it the Online Freedom Coalition? Freedom Online, Freedom Freedom Online Coalition. Coalition. What, what should be their response to making available um, um, tools that would enable freedom of expression to exist for people to be able to access you know, the, the, the use of VPNs, etc. On the reverse of it, obviously on the back of that discussion is also, should NetSweeper, which despite seven other providers internationally saying, we will not sell it to Pakistan, NetSweeper stuck its neck out from a developed country, a Western developed country, and said, no, I'll sell it to them. And to what extent should that coalition take action through either cooperation amongst themselves or national law and have their sovereignty applied to that. That would be another question. So I think that it, it, it is an issue, I mean, how do you track and survey? Because the moment you start getting filtering software, by the way, it doesn't just filter, it also surveys and you can track people down. So that's the point I think you were trying to make. So we also need to sort of look at sovereignty from the other perspective as well, not just the one where we can enable the blocking, but well, how do we keep it open? There can be coalitions that can do that. Well, wait a minute. Um, Bertrand, you mentioned that governments uh, may have the right or should have the right in certain circumstances to censor. Uh, no? Is that what you said? I, I am paying a lot of attention to words. Okay. And, and I, will, I will give you a, 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 a comment. We are addressing in the Internet and Jurisdiction Project three domains. Uh, domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data. 
And in the process, and in the meeting we had in Delhi, uh, Sunil Abraham, with his, who is with the Center for Internet and Society, uh, participated in the Delhi meeting, and he was at the workshop we organized yesterday. And, and close to the end of the workshop, he said, uh, one of the results of the discussion is that the documents that we produce are using very neutral wording that um, enable everybody to consider that it's a common problem and not uh, an advocacy piece. And he was joking, saying, if I had done your leaflet, instead of content takedown, I would have said, uh, fighting the increase of censorship. <laughs> and if it had been uh, access to user data is uh, the unacceptable amount of surveillance. That's the difference in terms of the process. I've never said that the uh, governments are allowed to censor. That's not the point. There are cases where content must be taken down. Yes. All right. Well, let us. <laughs> that's a very interesting distinction. If anyone in the audience has questions about that, you should feel free to, to ask. Micro, uh, microphone, uh, and if you, uh, <laughs> I'd like to comment. Mike Nelson, I just want to know if that made more sense in French. Because I don't understand how taking, requiring something to be taken down is not censorship. Uh, I mean, excuse me, the example that was, it makes more sense in France, as I explained before, taking down the content that is criminal in France posted by a Frenchman on the French platform, I don't call that censorship, sir. <laughs> that would be the answer of the government of France in my previous head. It is not censorship. Okay. Why so, can so, you call so we're not talking about legal content. No, I'm talking about, the distinction is precisely about the procedures that are being followed. Censorship is, I would qualify that, and it's a very interesting debate, actually, um, beyond the joke. Um, Censorship is when procedures are not followed, when there is a complete political legitim uh, legitimation for the reason why it is being done. It doesn't fit into the legal process that is done at the national level, or the national process is not balanced and proportionate. That's a very important element. There are national frameworks that do not specify, and there, there's a lot of work done by Access and other, and other groups, uh, especially in the, in the environment of necessary proportionate and so on, on what are the appropriate provisions for a national framework implementing the exemptions allowed by Article 29 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to limit, in certain cases, the exercise of uh, human rights freedoms and those provisions need to include judiciary processes, the right to have to be to be to have a contradictory procedures, mechanisms for appeal, proportionality, granularity, and you can continue the list. There are many national frameworks who do not have this. And in that case, when it is let's say, for instance, the brother or the dictator who happens to me, the Minister of Information, that says, oh, this is a statement that is against me because I had my fingers in the honeypot. I'm sorry, yes, that's censorship. But when it is the implementation of a court decision that is the application of a, um, of a national law that has been going through all the appropriate uh, bases, and it is considered as being a country that has a constitutional framework that ensures all the appropriate protection, I wouldn't call that censorship. The, the moment that it moves in the, in the extreme, or maybe, maybe you're right, maybe there's a difference, and maybe in the environment of the US, the expression censorship doesn't ring the same thing as, uh, as it does in France. Well, you're, you're basically saying the same act gets a different name depending on how democratic and constitutional the country is. And I, I, I just, I have a hard time drawing that line. May I just um, share our experiences or to the point? Um, there are certain cases, like um, the trans said, um, immediate danger to people's lives, perceived or real. Um, there, well, about a few months ago, there was one guy was killed while the group of people, youngsters in the teenagers were chatting over lying. And it became so bad that they can't sort of, well, they're starting to joke and, or, you know, more casual thing, but they're forced to kill the person. If that has been intercepted, 
one way or the other, it could have been stopped. In that case, my, one of the two institutions I work for are running a hotline locally. And sometimes they receive some kind of consultation or, or inquiry via email or, or um, the phones of the potential suicide. Or killings, some killings are happening. And people, once intercepted, they, they could inform either the law enforcement or the service providers or the both to try to take it down. And there, there are some, it sounds like a stream, but it could happen to the everyday life of people. It doesn't mean that police is um, 24 hours monitoring these communications, per se. But these are the instances. And uh, with the proliferation of smartphones and the cloud, it's getting easier to perhaps monitor by other people, if not necessarily the authority. But uh, these are the cases we are facing day to day as well. Uh, I had a quick response. I, I, I would fall on the, the other side of the, the argument. I think that there are times where, sure, for maybe public order and there's immediacy of danger and somebody may be killed or there's, there's information, you, you, you may, and I'm not, I, I, I'd like to think you shouldn't, but there may be some, some countries that may want to do something. But I want to sort of address some of these issues. Um, you know, where it may be uh, okay to say, well, anti-Semitic speech should be shut down, but at the same time, blasphemy could also be justified on the same basis, and uh, it, it doesn't matter in Pakistan whether that's going through the Ministry of Culture or Information or through a court order. The effect and the end result is the same. And so the question basically you would have is to say, well, uh, do we therefore, because there's a threat of a violent response, say that the violent response should not comply with the law because they are a mob and they will kill, and so we should just listen to what they're saying and not do things like forced busing for equality in the U.S., as an example. R versus Brown. Why should the blacks and whites not share things? Because, well, a court would say, oh my goodness, this is so terrible. The moment you start doing this, you're going to start hanging folks. Uh, but what did the U.S. do? They brought the military in and said, no. Rule of law trumps any argument that there's a mob out there. Now, so you may have to sort of diplomatically weigh some of those options at times, in, but in the longer uh, sort of uh, stretch of things, you need to be able to comply with the rule of law, not saying, well, it's okay, you know, this is going to create a problem and people are going to be angry, so I don't want to do this. That is inconsistent. That's not rule of law. That's not democratic. That also does not protect minorities because a minority always ha will have a mob against it. But I think I want to come to the earlier point I was making, which is that every time we discuss these issues, the extreme example of censorship, religious issues, and blasphemy, and anti-Semitism, and, and as, uh, you know, the, what, what is someone's, someone's law that basically gets me, I, I can't remember the gentleman who's in a, someone's law when you say every time Hitler or Nazis have to be referred to. Could you, could you tell me what God, Godwin's law. Godwin? Yeah. He's actually here. I'm glad I asked that. Okay. My God was actually here at the IGF. Exactly. You end up going to the, in the most extreme example. And I think the, the, the problem is that, as I said, you, you, let, let's, let's imagine a, a situation where you have a glass that is empty and a glass that is half full. The choice is, you're thirsty. Do you want to drink the glass that is half full and get agreement on the common ground? Say, for instance, join the Budapest Convention and at least deal with issues which everybody agrees on, which is child porn. Everybody agrees on phishing and fraud and hacking and illegal access. We all agree on this, but we won't do it. But yet, at the same time, we'll get very angry and say, but we should do something about the blasphemy and we should do something about the anti-Semitism. So I think in order to be rational about this and take the emotion out and deal with those issues, absolutely. But let's at least try to make progress where we can make progress and agree on the things that we have common ground on. We're not even making progress on those because we're all so torn by the politics internationally. Just, I was thinking further on, on, on the question you asked, which seemed like a joke, but is actually not. It's very interesting that... Uh, Whenever we use words, they are loaded with a lot of uh, personal experiences and, and national connections. And thinking about what you were saying, it is true that unconsciously in my mind, censorship is translated in censure in France, which used to be a regime which was an ex ante validation. Like, you have to submit your paper 
before publication so that somebody can say, no, this article not, but something that used, existed in the Soviet Union and so on. So I think when I answered, and the reason why I so strongly react about the distinction is because, in my view, the term censorship is evoking a mechanism that is so immediate or so ex ante that it is not at all the result of an ex post judiciary process and so on. So this is why I was making the distinction, I think, unconsciously. Uh, the second element that I want to, to, to say is I wholeheartedly support what I had just said about not dimensioning the processes to solve the extreme cases. This is what has led us to take, uh, taking our shoes out of uh, our feet in airports just because one guy, one day, had a minuscule amount of explosives in his souls. This is just nonsense. It is complete overreach. If indeed people are dealing with public order dangers, the biggest danger is when the framework is set to prevent any kind of danger. The best way to prevent any kind of danger in the streets and public order is preventing anybody to get out, and there's no mob and no problem. Freedom of expression is the same. Where you put the cursor is variable and is a case-by-case -case decision to make, which brings the last point, the importance of terms of service. It is fascinating for me to see that in the last few years, all the, com the large companies that have real cross-border in all countries' activities have progressively incorporated as part of their terms of service in the subpart that deals with community guidelines, elements that try to form a sort of general understanding of what is globally acceptable. And the best element in that regard is the progressive introduction of hate speech related provisions, which are absolutely not required under US law, and the platforms are in the US, and they could have tried to push completely a First Amendment approach to freedom of expression. But each one after another have tried with difficulty, but in a great convergence uh, in the end, to introduce things that deal with this. And Tumblr at the time had a wonderful formulation for that, which was, we do not condone malicious bigotry. And malicious bigotry was blasphemy, uh, um, attack against, um, against um, uh, racial or, or sexual or whatever orientations. And each platform is actually implementing on their own space rules that are community rules. And um, it is strangely an instrument of harmonization uh, globally that is emerging almost spontaneously. I think we had some comments uh, from the audience as well. Uh, the first comment, the first hand I saw was from a gentleman with a sort of a light blue shirt in the middle. Did you have a comment? It, yeah, I had a question about something separately. Purple. <laughs> it, it, that's okay. Um, my name is Jay Sadowski and I'm in the private sector and I'm a data center company. We have a, a lot of international customers so this, this whole forum is very interesting to me. Um, one thing that's coming to my mind is in terms of uh, access to user data, uh, you know, the government's right to access of user data in terms of sovereignty, let's say someone is in Pakistan and they upload a file to a server in America. Um, does that user have any rights that would be inferred to them because the data is now in America. So let's say, does, does America law enforcement have the right to say, well, your users in Pakistan, they have no American rights. They're not American. They're not in America. They weren't ever in America. Give us their data for any reason. I'm not a US attorney. Um, but from what I understand, and you know, I'm happy for anybody to correct me, um, the terms of service on the basis of which I have agreed to use that service uh, would be one, applicable. Number two, the U.S. has, I assume, greater protection when it comes to freedom of expression and First Amendment. That gives greater protection than Pakistan does. And in addition to that, um, if I'm doing something pretty heinous like a crime, it doesn't matter which country I am in, they'll get to me. So if it's something that is like a financial fraud, 
whether it's in Pakistan, Iran, US, European Union, the, and, and the data is in that country, they will find a way to get to it and, and take me down or you know, do whatever to that content. But if I'm doing something which is the kind of things we're talking about, then I choose a jurisdiction where I feel that my rights will be protected. And that's why when I, when I, when I speak from my perspective, I, I, I'm trying to gain the protection of the First Amendment in the US when I'm uploading something that basically allows me to have that free speech. So I wouldn't actually, on a practical basis, be concerned when it was freedom of expression that the US government, because of the way that it has its laws, would take that thing down. It didn't do it. As an example, let's look at a request made by the Pakistani government and by, I believe, others to take down the Innocence of Muslims video. It was on a cloud service uh, of Google Inc. And Google Inc. did not take it down. Uh, because it was a First Amendment freedom of expression issue, which, um, you know, people can have views about it, but uh, it didn't. And the, and F the FBI didn't go in and say, well, take it down. Now, if supposing it was being used to host some content to build an IED or a terrorist bomb, yeah, I'm sure that'll take it, get taken down. So I, I want to be a little more practical about what, what the examples are. Um, I think we had uh, other comments from the... Uh from this side of the room, I think first the lady with the with the red scarf. Yes, please, uh, if you'd like to identify yourself before the comment, if you like. Uh, this is not a comment, but I, I have a question. Uh, I I do uh, before uh, my name is Taylor Rahimi. I'm working as uh, for Mutual.com. It's a social media developer. So uh, I just having to experience actually with the cloud computing. Back in 2009, I was working with the Asia Development Bank with a grant project. It's a relatively small project, but we use uh, cloud service at the time is we are using Google Cloud and it's helping us a lot because of we are not being bothered with uh, all the issue with the server and everything like that. We just have to focus with how we are providing services to our user uh, or member at this, uh, this point, uh, I mean, for the producers uh, like fishermen or, or farmer. Uh, in other hands, um, recently I'm working for the uh, consultant for the government of Indonesia in one of the ministry. I will not say the name of the ministry, but it just, you know, we, this government is forcing to use their own server, put everything, uh, their information, uh, servers owned by them. And it's, for me, it is chaotic. First, they did not have a good human resource. The second, uh, they, they do not have a money to maintain. And the second, the third, it's, it just like, you know, the investment that they are spending for huge servers, they, it's just huge. The money, to the investment is just huge, and it's not even used effectively. I, I mean, I have no idea, but it's just like uh, very sad because of if government starts to pushing people to uh, use the uh, cloud, I mean, they, they have their own server and their own cloud that is located in, in, the, in their own locations or country, it's going to be huge mistakes for developing country like Indonesia, I think. Uh, second, I do have, I mean, you know, there's always bad and good person in life. I think it just, it happens all the time. We cannot, but the thing is, we cannot forbid clouds or people who make a bad content to put the, something in cloud services because uh, you can sometimes, be, if there is an opportunity, there will always be a crime for that. So I just wonder, rather than we asking government to government the cloud services, I prefer to, to, to have an energy policy that allows the commercial cloud to have an awareness or education uh, program to its users about how, the, how they should not uh, be influenced or something like that by the negative content. That thing, it's something that I'm not seeing from cloud commercial services. I have no, I, I hope any of you can give comments on that. Thank you very much. 
two points. I think you're absolutely right. I think the, the awareness in developing countries on what cloud is, how it works, and having those presentations made not just to users but also especially uh, enterprises in those developing countries as well as especially government so that the misconceptions about the security aspects sometimes uh, are, are you know, something that, that can be resolved. I think that's, that's very, very helpful and, and I agree with you. Um, and, and, and taking the example of you know, basically when you start doing this and say, no, no, you have to use the local service, what it does is creates protectionism. Protectionism creates higher costs, lower efficiencies, and, when, when, and these sort of centers which are being created are, are, are not able to compete because you need a critical mass, and this is something we discussed in, in, in a workshop that was done yesterday, you need at least a critical mass of people uh, with, with the amount of money coming in to, to run these data centers, uh, unless you're using public money to do it, and it's taxpayer money. Uh, but for users, uh, ordinary people, uh, they want to use something cheaper and then accessible and immediately. And that's what they, wear. they have to go to the economies of scale which the cloud provides, which, which local data centers cannot. And you're absolutely right. Sometimes what happens is that when you start, uh, you know, there's, there's always bad in, in most of good. I mean, it's, it's, it's a minority. And when you say, well, uh, let me share an example with you f from, from Pakistan. We had... Um, 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 uh, basically foreign exchange regulation, you know, money changers, etc. And because those money changers, uh, a segment of them were doing something illegally, uh, the government came down on them and said, no, no, I'm not going to try you for the illegal thing you did and try and focus on that and shut that down. I'm going to shut down the entire business. And that was done because they wanted to go to the banks, actually, frankly. But anyway, but when they shut it down, guess what happened? Now suddenly you didn't have any legal means to transfer money and guess who won? The criminals. Because now it wasn't the legal businesses. The entire forex system's gone completely underground. You don't have information. You don't have intelligence. You don't know who's doing it what. They're, it's you know, operating out of garages. And the crime has actually increased tenfold. So when you, when you try to sort of address the problem by addressing something that's good, you know, and, and the reason why people aren't going after them is because they think, yes, but he's only trying to get money to send to his mother. So even though he's a criminal, but you really do understand he's doing a great service. So suddenly he gets the protection because, you know, the similar thing when it comes to VPNs. You try to block a whole domain name, guess what? People are going to start using VPNs because now they have to have it. It becomes a basic requirement. Sorry. Just, oh, yeah, go ahead, just, to, just to pick up on your other point about content and whether it should be, you know, the role of governments with content. I think the answer is, is in many instances, rather than um, focusing on bad content, is more content. And then tr what we, as a platform, are trying to do is enable people to report the content themselves so that it doesn't have to necessarily uh, escalate to a government type issue. So we, we have reporting links on, on almost every Facebook page. You can report specific items of content. You can do that either by reporting it to, to us or reporting it directly to the person responsible to the content. So we've developed, and these, these are new innovations. They're sort of social reporting flows where you're then facilitated with the other user who posted the content is a, is a relatively new innovation. And what we're finding is that in, in the vast majority of instances that gets pulled and the content gets pulled down by the person that posted it. So you're not having, um, having to escalate it. But I think Bertrand's point about hate speech and the fact that platforms are starting to develop their own response to that is, is an important one um, because I think the why you know the reason that that is an innovation is you're saying that um, you're accepting that there's a there's a type of speech um, incitement basically um, that shouldn't shouldn't be on a platform shouldn't be being but where it's challenging is that you have to take in context like you can't identifying hate speech or identifying incitement can't be done in an academic sense it's completely dependent on that context and, and what we're trying what you know the reason that uh, platforms are starting to address this issue is because you can't um, you can't be responsive purely to a crowd response so it can't simply be that because someone or a crowd respond violently to speech doesn't mean that it is automatically incitement or hate speech. You need more context. You and the reason that um, one of the challenges here is, 
unless you do that, unless you have a more nuanced, sophisticated approach, you're, you're essentially creating a heckler's veto, right? Where people who behave the worst online are the ones who have the most power in defining um, the bounds of online speech. Essentially, and so that's and so you're seeing um, you're seeing companies and and sort of trying to grapple with that, um, and and I think if you if you don't do that, if you don't have um, some bounds and some ability for context, then you know you're a you know a crowd response. Um, you know, for example, images from civil rights movement, a crowd response to that in that co would probably be to take it down. So I think you're, you're starting to see um, innovation in this area and trying to be responsive so that it doesn't automatically rise up to the government level. Um, I think we had one more comment on this side of the room from the back, the gentleman with the white jacket, yes. Okay, and then right after the gentleman with the dark jacket. Please. Yeah. Um, my name is Jorge Avin. I am a member of the government of the Uruguay, um, Latin American Republic. And in fact, I am uh, a member of the board of the agency for the e-government and information society and knowledge development. So uh, we are very involved in this kind of thing. We don't like the censors. We don't really. We don't like the censors. Um, we have a, a special department of the police to persecute a cyber crime. It, they, they act at the same at the same way um, when the, uh, it's denounced uh, an, another kind of crime. Mm. There is no difference. The difference is. Uh, which is a cyber crime. Is there a list of cyber, cyber crimes? No, there aren't. And this is the problem. The other, um, in, in, in my country, all the child have a laptop for free when they are in the public school. And uh, so we have to protect him. And to protect him, the, we develop a policy based on the information and basic in, in a kind of game, the role game, when in, they're playing this game, uh, this learn how to use a government the privacy if this is information privacy. And also we have uh, many people um, explaining in conference to the different uh, level of the people of the country uh, ages of uh, ancient, uh, young people, uh, and uh, so on, how to protect his personal data. Mm -hmm. And we think that is the best that we can do at this moment. Mm -hmm. And wait for the, uh, and we expect that this is going to be uh, good results in the Thank you very much. Those are great comments, especially with regards to uh, education. That's very, very helpful. That's certainly going to change um, the, uh, the landscape uh, in the future, uh, in the short future most likely. Um, we have four minutes left. I think we can take one. I think we're going to have time for just one more comment um, here on the left. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tiku Jumpana. I'm with the ISOC ambassador at the IFGF from Indonesia, and in real life, I'm with the academia. So, um, privacy versus uh, freedom of expression is always an interesting debate, and I think the government is in a dilemma because um, why do we need government? Because we need a legal body to govern, uh, to protect society, but. At one point, um, government needs to protect privacy in this country because people ask for it, right? 
And uh, on the other hand, uh, government also needs to support freedom of expression because uh, got people also ask for it. So like Petron said just now, that uh, uh, freedom of expression has no limit, and privacy is actually about creating limits. So I think there should be a balance in be between privacy and freedom of expression. So the question is how to balance it. Right. This is just a, a very quick comment from me and uh, a, a brief question. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. We'll see if we have a response, but I want to make sure we get everyone a chance, if they can, to get in one last comment. There was a lady in the center in blue. Did, in the blue, did you have a comment or a question? Um, I just wanted, yes, my name is Algiro Karnasiu, and I'm also um, an ISO ambassador and um, a lecturer in law at Bournemouth University, UK. Um, just a brief observation, really. Um, I don't necessarily believe that diversity is a bad thing. Um, I guess part of the solution would also be to embrace diversity. Um, it's a good thing that nowadays users have actually the chance to shop around and be able to create content by using, for example, following the, the example that uh, was said earlier on, using the US jurisdiction, uh, which favors, um, or at least it, it protects in a better way under the First Amendment freedom of expression. So why would it be necessarily a bad thing uh, to actually have different options, especially now in the era of cloud computing, where it's also easier to transfer servers there and be able to avoid all jurisdictional matters? Thank you very much for, uh, for that comment. Um, did we have uh, any other comments from the floor? We have 30 seconds uh, in the front. Just a quick question about uh, the right to data portability, which is a proposal floating around the European Union. Is this good for human rights and privacy or bad for human rights and privacy? Knowing that we have 10 minutes left, I'll answer that one. It's good. <laughs> Um, definitely, uh, for, for uh, an expression purpose. But it, it, you can actually do it? I mean, particularly, this is particularly direct or directed to Facebook because the part of the right to data portability is to be able to take all the data that I have on my social media network and take it to another social media network, including all the information about all my contacts who may not want their information taken to a different site. I've been informed I have 10 seconds to respond. <laughs> but uh, so we developed a tool actually far beyond the, far earlier than the DPR provision came out uh, called down, Download Your Information that, that essentially enables this. And you can, um, so, you know, it came out of uh, our work with the Irish Data Protection Commissioner and uh, a very thorough audit we had with them. And through this tool, you can have every single post, comment, everything else, down, downloaded and, and sent to you. So I think part of, um, part of the question is developing uh, technological solutions, but whether you need a, um, a harsh regulatory approach to, to stem that or not. I, I, I mean, and I, I think if you look at the genesis of the tool, that it came out of a, a proactive, you know, developed relationship with a regulator rather than trying to create one solution that's uh, uh, fairly blunt um, and fairly static when you look at the way that tech, you know, that can be, that provision might be outdated in, with the evolution of the next tool. So I, I think my, my point is, I, without, um, I think we can be responsive without needing to take such formal uh, regulatory measures. That's way over 10 seconds. And, and with that said, that will be a great segue for perhaps a panel that we'll continue with uh, next year at the next IGF. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for participating. Thank you, the panelists, and for the audience and participation. And we uh, are closing this panel. Thank you. <laughs>